This is Space Cats Peace Turtles, the unofficial podcast for Fantasy Flight's Twilight Imperium. Episode 84, four-player 14-point with Muat, featuring Yin for Life. Music by Ben Prunty, featuring Matt Martins and Hunter Donaldson. the thing about here's the thing i want to point out about i don't know i can't imagine yin for life's screen name was yin for life before we started this show yeah because we started the show with the hatred of yin and so then you would assume the name came from fr- yin for life screw uh, you guys yin is good which means from the get-go from from the inception of us knowing yin for life he has been kind of kind of messing with us a little bit mm-hmm. like a little tongue-in-cheek he's got it out for us uh, and things have not changed over that amount of time. Yeah. Uh, so, so what, what did we do today, Matt? What did we do? We played a 14 point game. <laughs> it was a four player game. Hunter Donaldson was the embers of Muat, his notorious favorite faction. Oh, and I... actually, I want to go ahead and say this at the top. Uh, I am probably not going to play embers of Muat ever again. Ever again. Like, I think that's, so Hunter is uh, that's not, Hunter, enough. In the revised guides, Hunter is not doing the Muat. Oh, guide. no. I'm No, Matt, is, are you hearing that that's for the me. first time? Because the, you should, <laughs> this, this should not be you hearing that for the first time. Matt, <laughs> I am not doing that guy. <laughs> I am not playing that faction ever yeah. again. C- copy that. Yeah, because, like, uh, that's the thing that people don't understand about me and the Muat is that I don't, <laughs> I don't like the Muat, but also, like, I've still played Muat more than any other faction. Uh-huh. Do you understand? Right. Like, yeah. do you all get that? <laughs> like, that it's a faction I dislike, and it's not for lack of trying. <laughs> and it's not like I haven't experienced it enough already. Like, I have played them more than any other faction that I've played. Yeah, I, there are nice. factions and, that I love that I've only played, like, twice. Right. You know? I've only so played des- Ghost once. Despite all of that, uh, the setup for Yin for Life's Space Kitty episode, which is what today is, to Space Kitty episode, was Yin for Life really wanted to dig the knife into Hunter's gut and force him to play Muat with some considerations, right? right. So the whole the, the onset was a trolley little episode, a trolley little like I'm gonna make you play him, but it was more okay. What can we do to balance that out? What how can we make everybody have? A, if we're gonna force Hunter to have a bad time, mm-hmm. how do we make everybody have a bad time? Right. And there's a really simple solution. And that's let uh, Billy, also known as In Mac We Trust, make also the known map, as the cartographer the of chaos. Yeah, AKA let, let him design the, the game. The map man, aka uh, uh, <laughs> the map daddy. Yeah, aka map daddy. Miggy miggy map daddy. Map uh, daddy. AKA so you're, the voice you're Billy hearing, the map. The that we need to point out the voice you're also hearing today is not Yin for Life. Yin for Life didn't want to be a part of the recording of the episode just for his own stuff. But we wanted to bring in a third voice because we had our dear friend EJ Sanders live stream the game. So it was nice to have kind of a third party perspective on the uh, the madness that went down today. Yeah. So EJ, how's it going? It's going great. Uh, I just uh, it's really good, Matt. How did you enjoy <laughs> your day? Uh, this is. Uh, this is how I wanted to spend my Memorial Saturday. <laughs> this was it. I woke up. I actually, Monday, I was like, how can I make my weekend better? And <laughs> this was it. Oh, my gosh. Uh, so let's, should we, we got to break down this game a little yeah, bit. Yeah, let's. Today let's, we're going to uh, talk about well, this game. I, I feel like we haven't quite spelled out exactly what, what the what the, the settings of was. It? Uh, so Billy, bleh, that that wasn't good. Um Billy made the map, and he made, uh, I think initially he was going to do a very mean map. Very um, mean. Instead, he did a pretty interesting map. Uh, yep. I, I was a little upset about my slice, but there was yeah. a really cool um, kind of trick to it, which was that yeah. every slice, because it was a four-player map, every slice had both tech skips to one color. So, like, right. I and had it was designed both, yeah. around the faction. Like, he, we knew on the front end what factions were going to be playing, so he put factions in specific spots and gave them tech skips that in theory lean into their faction right yeah yeah 
Uh, yeah, so, so Hunter's example is he had all the red skips. Mm-hmm. Uh, Muat get you know an easy skip to prototype War Sun two to to skip over the the junk you kind of don't want. Right. Uh, the Arborek had the green skips. Winu, which was who I was playing, had the yellow skips, and the Sardak Nor had uh, the blue skips. So three, four bad factions uh, with tech skips to give them a leg up was ended up being kind of the theme mm-hmm. of this game. That's a pretty cool theme, all in all. Yeah, I love the map. To be totally honest with <laughs> well, you, I mean, there's, my... there's obviously weird weaknesses to it, but like, what map doesn't have a weird weakness? I don't. I, I like. I felt weird about my slice just because I had a lot of influence and not much else. Uh, and yeah. I, I wonder, Matt, did you feel that way? Was your slice a little too My catered? slice was very bad for influence. Like, because I had uh, the two yellows, one of those yellow skips is Lazar Saculag, which is a fairly kind of like weak system, all things considered. It's three resources and basically an influence you'll never use. And then Wellen, which is two influence, but that's like just shy of what you really need. Um, and the rest of my slice was was Arnor Lore and Quan in the, or Lodor in the opposite direction. So like, just not a lot of available, convenient influence. Like, I didn't have a single zero three 3 until you get to the equidistant between me and Arborek, and mm-hmm. that's Torcan. But for most of the game, I basically had, like, no influence uh, or, or no, no command counter generators. As, right. a thir- as a third party, I did look at Arborek's slice and, and just shake my head at the beginning of the game. Oh, it's, it's not good either. Yeah. yeah. There's, there's rough stuff all around. Yeah. I mean, the, what the, the theme for this map forces it to be kind of, like, really strange setups. Yeah, yeah, and and also the anomalies were set up in such a way as to, they were in between your home system and Mechatol, uh, yeah. which is which... Uh, a theme uh, that we've seen in other maps as well. Uh, right. But I, I overall, I, I didn't have the map was probably the least like, impactful, like, worst part for me. Um, right. I just, I just could not, for the life of me, get a, a place to put like a second space dock. Just right. the way things ended up shaking out. Like there was a point where I put a space dock on uh, Mechatol Rex in this game just because I was like, well, I could just build the second war sun out of it. And I guess that's all I'll do. But yeah, um, right. But that is something it, that I did. It should be worth noting before we really dig into like the, the rest of the game, the other setup thing, which was probably the oddest choice uh, was Billy uh, gave us our starting it's a four player game so we're going to get two strategy cards he assigned our first strategy cards so round one we only picked one strategy card we were given a strategy card which uh and and the strategy cards were supposed to be like a thing you would want right so sardak got tech winu got warfare arborek got trade and that left mua ending up with leadership which there was kind of a uh, a dispute about whether or not that was good or not um I, I know magi magi felt that was like the best like, he was very jealous of that pick he thought I, that I was mean, a really I great under, pick. like magi said that his oh also have we mentioned yet that magi was in this game oh yeah magi so, was the fourth player <laughs> yeah magi was the fourth player playing as the arborek um magi had a really good logic for why leadership was good um to be fair uh it was sure. just essentially that you know it's a four player game There's going to be a lot of secondaries to use in that first round. You want to have leadership. Leadership is a lot more powerful in a four-player game. As somebody who's never played four-player before, uh, that did not occur to me beforehand. But I think what what kind of got what kind of grabbed my ghoulies a little bit about this idea was that I felt like I I actually couldn't pick. I mean, I just I I didn't have. (laughs) I was just stuck with the strategy that I was stuck with. I, I wanted a different strategy card. Yeah. Um and yeah, you wanted to do your own thing. And, and in in Twilight Imperium, you're never guaranteed a strategy card, right? But the fact that they had already been assigned kind of bummed me out just a teensy wet bit. Well, and we should talk too about just the idea of the setup of this game put things on a weird foot right off the bat, right? I mean Right. Well, yeah, certain, I mean this game was cer- somewhat about crafting the my my least favorite all of yeah. the things that I all of my least favorite ways to play Twilight Imperium, that's, you know, I'm playing my least favorite faction. I'm, we're playing my least favorite player count. We're playing to 14 points, which is not, I don't inherently hate 14, but that means right. that we're going to play the, the longest possible like. yeah. four-player <laughs> game, you know? Right. Yeah. So, I don't know. EJ, what was your feelings going into this? Just from the setup as a third party, like, how did you feel about the game as a spectator kind of going into this? Uh, going did, like uh b- before the game even fair. started. 
Huh? Yeah, well, yeah. Just knowing the setup, did did it seem like a way you would want to start a game? Uh, it depends on who it is, but uh, for the most part, I think I wouldn't have been too sad with. I guess. I, I wouldn't have been too sad with being Winu with a grav rift in front of me. That would have probably right. been the grav only... rift starting with warfare. I mean that that was set up for a round one mechatol possibility. Right. I don't love the I don't love the round one mechatol thing, uh, in general. Mm-hmm. But it's there. Boy, what, boy, is it there. Right. Um, but the other three slices, uh, yeah, it it, it, it wasn't them. it wasn't really made to to be super pleasing. They gave you some tech skips, which is nice, but. Uh, outside of that, it wasn't like super helpful. I didn't think, uh, and I, right. I really, I really was hoping that the map would be set up more for middle of the board plays. But with yeah. uh, an asteroid field and a bunch of two planet systems surrounding Mechatol, uh, you know, you right. can pretty comfortably sit there without having to uh, do too many, you know, crazy plays to get to Mechatol or, or anything right. like that. So there was there was a lot of middle of the board play once you guys got there, but it just took so long to get there. It was a little bit boring up until that point sure yeah yeah and that, i mean that's a four player big map too we play like we didn't play with warp zones we didn't play with shaved edge galaxy and when you play with the big map the normal size map and four player everyone's just rich and it's kind of a slow crawl those first few uh rounds are, are mostly people just doing standard expansion stuff yeah uh this game had a, a slightly different thing which was the fact that i decided i'd better lean into the uh the th- the thematics of what was going on in this game, and I decided I did need to risk it for the biscuit on my first action. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I did, in fact, go through the rift trying to get to what was Abyss Freya, which was adjacent to Mechatol Rex, and I had Warfare, so I certainly would have had the opportunity to, if I had gotten there, then go to Mechatol uh, round one. Now, things didn't go so well for me. Uh, boy... Uh, just to just to bury the lead a little bit, I lost a total of three out of four ships to the rift, and all of that in the first two rounds. So not a good early game for the Winu. Notorious for good, for really good early games. Yeah, I mean, to be fair though, with the whole like Winu thing, I I have always heard that Winu is better in four player. Now I feel like we oh, didn't definitely. say that that much while we were playing, but like it like I feel like that's consistent with what. No, I, I felt it, and and I'll say this much about it: I was willing to risk to do those risks because I would I knew I had time on the back end to come back around. Right. Nobody was close enough to me to jump on my home system, and especially the way expansion was starting to go early, it was like no one's coming towards me, so I can I can risk it and I can rebuild later. Right. It, it hurts my round one, but if any if the tournament taught me anything, it's that round one isn't as important as people say yeah I now mean, i could i could have i could have had a horrible round one i ended up salvaging it a little bit through some th- through some some trades that i you know i had to give up more than i got uh to save my round one but it saved it enough to where i could survive into the mid game um and that that's only the case because it was a 14 point game where it's like you've got a lot of room on the back end yeah uh, i mean so what do we remember about uh magi's round one as the arborec i feel like Start. He he got to start with trade. Yeah, that's helpful. Which was good. Um, got a Sarween. Uh, he stalled a lot too. He he stalled to, until like basically everything else was done before he actually started expanding. Like he didn't move any ground forces until like his fourth or maybe fifth action. Yeah, he went ahead and locked down his uh, his victory point uh, first round to get the two adjacent yeah, to the guitar. Right. Yeah, he yeah, sent cruisers true, out true. and 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 yeah, he he made a play for just the point and then worried about his expansion after that. Yeah. Um, I don't remember where his like second cruiser came from or whatever, but yeah, he he did lock down that. Well, and he, he established a trade thing too. He had Sardak come to him through their shared beta wormhole, uh, and so how nice of already, Sardak to set that up. Yeah, <laughs> really. Uh, but but in general, yeah, I think I think he had as solid of a start as Arborek can possibly hope for. You know, right. outside of just like the best ever politics action card draw. You know, he didn't have the crazy lucky Arborek start. He had a absolutely solid arbor x start well i will say this like uh i get a lot of flack for you know in the and i hate it but the saying that diplomacy is a good round one pick for arbor way back in the arbor um, strategy uh-huh. episode i mean I'll, I'll we'll never live that down but one thing i was thinking about arbor as far as like the way that they get better in four player is that diplomacy is definitely going to get picked exactly. round one and the fact that he already had 
trade in his hand, and then also there was a diplomacy secondary to play off of. Like there was no way he was going to have a, a bad rough round. start. You know what yeah, I mean? It's actually really it's kind of a great. It makes Arborek a less bad faction. The fact that diplomacy is definitely going to be in there I, now. It, getting the command counters to make all that work can be a little tricky. Sure, um, but. It's still helpful. I mean, it's just, yeah. That, Arborek is one of those factions that has certainly benefited by all eight strategy cards being in the game. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, anything else we want to say about round one? I, I don't uh, I mean, it's remember su- too much about Sardak Nor. Like what? I mean, the fact that he started with tech was really helpful. And he did, because of the trade with Arborek, he was able to get two tech round one, mm-hmm. which yeah. is now he's now he is no longer behind. Like, round one disadvantage gone after the start of round one right Right. that's that's basically how that works is you had tech you got two tech looks like you're on par now with everybody in this game all of us only started with one tech which means by the end of round two at most any of us have two tech and he was right there with us so he he immediately got rid of his basically only disadvantage uh in the game yeah i mean my my round one was because i did not have warfare or anything i didn't really have any options as far as like expanding out super quickly sure so I basically just took Aaron Amir and was like, well, that's it. And the good thing that I got to do, uh, obviously because of leadership, is I did do a lot of secondaries, meaning I did like, you know, I was able to do the secondary of tech and then like politics and yeah, like, yeah, I, I actually don't think I did warfare, um, but I, I was able to kind of get started on a couple things. And one of the action cards I drew, like the first action card I drew was a flank speed. So I had Aaron Amir and a flank speed going into round two. So I was like, I pretty much know what I'm going to do mm-hmm. from this point. Yeah. Um, yeah. In that, I was only I only I needed the flank speed to get to Mechatol, and I right. had Aaron Amir to actually take it. So, which is the I would say the only like majorly notable thing about round two. Everyone just expanded, kept doing the normal thing, but you jumped on Mechatol Rex before I could. Yeah, I was I was ready to take Mechatol Rex, and you nabbed it up from me. So you got the free point there. And I lost another carrier and a dreadnought to the rift. So by by midway round two, I had lost eleven and a half resources to the rift. Yeah, and that was the end of my rifting. I w- I didn't go through the rift ever again because it it had spurned me. Yeah, it, it also one right before we get deep into round two or just even further, I I do want to mention uh, in a in a weird toss of luck, I actually ended up with the speaker token in round one. Right. Uh, but because we had already had our strategy cards assigned to us, it meant very little. Um, and it actually kind of w- wasn't great because I then couldn't take politics for myself. And I right. probably would have rather had the speaker token going into uh, to round, round two. two. However, I did luck out and was able to grab Imperial. So in round two, when I took uh, Mechatol and scored the first point... Uh, which, by the w- way, uh, somebody had put my face on the other side of the custodian's token. <laughs> oh, and also I should mention that there was a digital gun pointed at me the entire time. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> to kind of create, I guess, like to... tension uh, with <laughs> with it. Uh, and I should say, like, I, I got pretty salty in this game pretty much throughout <laughs> the entire thing. I actually I kind mean... of thought it was the point, but uh, I, I feel like at times if you watched it, uh, I was maybe saltier than I wanted to be, which uh, I am proud that I have not made that mistake since, uh, since last big year, one. that big one yeah. where yeah. I messed up. So uh, I will say, though, you know this what? was another uh, Hunter Got Too Salty kind of day. <laughs> um, yeah, so so round two is pretty standard. Going into round three is when stuff started to, to, to change. Um, EJ, I'm curious where you thought I don't know. I don't even know how much you were digging into strategy with chat. Did what? What was the vibe going into round three ish? Yeah, we were mostly just worried about Brian the entire time. Uh, no, uh, he, uh, he, uh, Brian. Yeah, he's in our chat. Oh, he was. Oh, I see. Brian yeah, was he was. Out you know, and... he was having a good time, uh, <laughs> and we could not have as good of a time as he was having as we were watching this game. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. This was a. Uh, this was actually pretty oh, fun. Wait, 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 you said Brian. Do you mean Billy? No, no, he means Brian. Brian. Blarger of Meme Town. Tom Boots. Oh, yeah. wow. Okay. Blarger, yeah. 
Yep. Uh, uh, so, so he just he loved it. He loved my I'm, feelings. And I'm not everything. really sure. He was he was already like three glasses vodka deep. So uh, okay. <laughs> you can leave that out too. Um, <laughs> nope. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah. Uh, for the most part, I thought um, heading into round three, I was like, I was actually really surprised at how even the game was. I thought, yeah. I was like, I was like, you know, I was kind of just half paying attention there for a while and then like once i looked up at the scoreboard round three is like oh i need to start like investing Figuring in what's <laughs> going on because yeah because like three players are at five points one player's at four points and it's anybody's game going forward yeah, I, at right. first because i guess i had a misconception too of what maybe was going to happen and that was oh you know hunter and matt might get left in the dust uh, right. and uh that didn't happen so i was very proud Not of yet you. anyways well Not yet. Well, yeah, Hunter Hunter is soon to be left in the dust, but Well, yeah, right. but uh, let's well, let, here, let me tell it. Um <laughs> so so essentially in round 3, um I kind of had a decision to make, which was am I going to like obviously this to me this game has been set up as like kind of a as a my nightmare scenario. Right. And in my head I was like I want to strike back at at the people that have put me in this situation. <laughs> so I wanted to play I so I, I make them like pay. I had said before I I placed my space dock on Mechatol Rex. I get my second war sun out there. And so now I've got kind of like not a great fleet, mostly just two war suns and a bunch of fighters, yeah. maybe like one destroyer. And uh I start striking back at Magi who has been yeah. able to expand like quite well, but he's Arborek. Right. And, There's not good fleets out there. It's mostly a lot of ground forces. Right. And he was also already clearly starting to go down like PDS2 Graviton route. Right. So it was sort of like we need to strike while the iron is hot. Like there now is kind of the last chance to do anything about Magi's slice. Right. Which was is sort of the vibe I got. Like I'll say this for four player. Um, PDS is so viable. Yeah, it's ridiculous definitely. how yeah. viable PDS is because you're you're always gonna have an opportunity to do it every single round, which is another reason that this type of this it sucks. Like this, you sucks. know, it's a good counter to Muat PDS with Graviton. Dude, there were so many good counters to Muat in this yep. game. Um, yep, uh, Ixtra Ix would have a field day in a four player sure. game like oh, this. Oh, for sure, for sure. Sardax Exo Trireme two that he got pretty quickly. Yep. That was a nightmare for yeah, Muat. So, so essentially, I was at round three looking at my two neighbors, and this is what I was saying. Arborek is going PDS Arborek with with Graviton. Um, I don't have a fleet, and I don't have a good planet as a forward space dock. So I feel like I'm like basically my my War Sun Ball is what I got, and it's you know it's capable. Um, it would have been I think really good at slamming into Matt. Matt is sitting across from me. He's not my neighbor. Um, yeah. So I'm looking at both my neighbors, being like, well, this is going to be rough. Uh, and also, I have going into this kind of a default allegiance to Matt, basically. Sure. I'm feeling like, oh, this is like, this is a this is a weird situation I'm kind of fa- finding myself in. And it feels goofy. Um, and there's also a gun pointed at me. But uh, <laughs> so so in, in round three, I'm ba- I, I basically just decide like, I'm going to strike back. All right. I'm going to show, yeah. I'm going to show them while I still can. Well, while, while right. war some will still be an option. So um, essentially, I, I take two systems from Magi, just bam, bam. But that basically yep. take, like, no losses. And right. also, in that same round, I get War Sun 2. Um, now, before we move on to the next round, I, I want to make sure that, Matt, you get in. Like, how was round... What what was round two three, three four. Well, two is when I took... Mecha, you abandoned Mechatol to start getting into... Uh, or, or Yeah, round three is when you abandoned Mechatol. Right, right. Uh, round round two is when I lost all my stuff. So like round two was very bad, and I just was already starting to think things were over. Although I wasn't, it was very bad. But like I I had set up an early space dock that was a little bit forward, and I was prepared to find a way to come back. I wasn't I didn't buy tech the first two rounds, mm-hmm. um, and I just put everything into into uh, units because I knew that was going to be the only way I was going to hang on. So for me, round three and four were were more about. Uh, just getting further set up round three you left mechatol so i jumped on it and round four was kind of finished i i had a, a not taken a lot of stuff in my slice and i was finishing take I, I didn't end up taking Wellen, which was adjacent to me until like round five or something but round three and four i was still getting systems in my in my like home slice uh, and i was pretty nervous about sardak and i kind of had this weakly defended border against each other and I never knew if that was going to pop off or not. So I was always kind of loosely 
afraid of that but i was just trying to get myself back in the game by that point mm -hmm. um and and you letting like you bailing on mechatol gave me that opportunity to, to maybe start turning things around yeah i thought uh for sure the biggest uh thing that happened in three and four were actually from yin and magi uh they did a really good job of of just steadily building out so yeah uh and and establishing a uh kind of a perimeter yeah, yeah magi i mean but was already starting to kind of run away with just the number of planets he had and, mm -hmm. and having solid ground force. He did the good thing of, you know, a lot of Arborex will put way too many ground forces on like one planet. They'll just like dig in. He, he just kept moving forward, like ever forward and, and leaving some ground forces behind and just like completely filling out his slice and leaving room for the PDS to come in. And yeah, it just both of their slices looked like things that were going to be very difficult to ever try to dig in. They were doing really good with their economy. And I, and I will say this, I think I, I originally was like going into this game. My plan was that's what I wanted to do. I was like, I'm just going to put a lot. I'm going to ignore the, the victory points and I'm just going to put a lot of plastic on the table the problem yeah. was my slice was mostly influence so i right. was like not going to win that game so right. i was like oh okay so in the early game i'm like i'm gonna go for mechatol and i do end up getting i got three points off mechatol i was like keeping up with the pack and couldn't score anything which was crazy i couldn't even score right. my secrets so right. i'm like i'm staying in this game just off the back of mechatol but the thing about four player that i realized is that i'm taking this imperial card every you know i took it two two rounds in a row yeah and everybody else is taking stuff that's basically just making them money like that's just getting right. them ahead in right. the numbers game and i was like man this is not gonna work like if yeah. i focus on taking imperial at this point i am i am going to eventually lose in in right. the late game now i think i may have overreacted and like jumped off i think i could have stayed on mechatol probably for another round maybe gotten right. even more imperial points but it did feel like the writing was on the wall for me. Right. Um, going into round four. Uh, and if we're ready, if we're ready to talk about round four, I'm ready to talk about it. Uh, you mean round five? This game went faster than you even realized. Round oh five my is God. when you, yeah, you're is right. when you round did the five. So round five is when you did the big thing. So round five, I'm poised uh, with uh, War Sun 2, and I could strike at uh, Magi's home system. The problem is. I, I well, I can't really. It looks like I can, and in fact, he he feels like that's what I'm about to do. Um, but he has PDS with Graviton. Yeah. There's no way that they don't take out at least one War Sun. Which the problem? I I don't have a real fleet. I just have War Suns with yeah. lots of fighters, which is not good. Yep. Um, it's not good fleet composition. Uh, but so what I end up deciding to do is uh, take them through a wormhole and then come to through um, an alpha wormhole. I can get to the space right next to uh, Sardak Nor's home system. Right. Uh, so I make a deal with Magi where I just bold face lie to him for my first first time in Twilight Imperium. <laughs> I ever did that. I just told him I was going to do. Uh, I mean, I've never just straight up been like, I'm going to do this. And then immediately I don't do it. Yeah, Matt, not. come on. Like, no, I'm, yeah, I think you're probably right. Yeah. I think you're probably right. Yeah. So, and and that's the thing is, like, in, in this game, I just had this, like, feeling of, like, this is different, all right? The rules yeah. are different. <laughs> I'm, like, it's like I'm playing with the gloves off, and it's like a uh -huh. street fight, right? Um, right. So I pull off this maneuver that someone actually used. I believe it was T.G. Welch, uh, and let me know, Welch, if, if I'm just making this up. But I remember playing a Goodyear Brotherhood game with somebody where I, I didn't leave any ships in my home system. Everything was in the space next to it. And they attacked me, used a skilled retreat to then blockade my home system. And right. I, I thought it was a crazy move. And I remember at the time being like really annoyed by it because I had to play like an unexpected action in order to like yeah. fix it. It like really ruined my game. So I was like, I'll just do that because I had a skilled retreat. I was like, all right. So... I'm, and also, I'm scared of Sardak Nor at this point because he's he yeah. has Exo Trireme. He only has and one. And you had Warfare. Right. So so the idea was skilled retreat to home system, Warfare on the home system, attack the home system, and then my other strategy card was Construction. So it was going to be <laughs> it was going to be Warfare into take one of the planets of his home system, Construction. Now I have my forward space stock. Right. That, that's in, actually in worth Kinara. something. Yeah. <laughs> right. So so it, it was. It was going to be so beautiful. Um, 
And then what ended up happening was I pulled off the skilled retreat, uh, obviously, because, I mean, I, he didn't have a sabo, so there was there was no way that it wasn't going to happen. Um, he counterattacks, and technically, I hadn't done the math, but I believe I had the advantage. I think uh, you did, um, if only slightly. Yeah, not, not by a crazy amount. Um, and I rolled everything, and I had a crazy amount of hits. Like, I had to- totally had it in the bag. But I accidentally clicked. We didn't. We couldn't use any of the normal TTS like dice battle calculator things. stuff. All that stuff was broken. Yeah. So I accidentally clicked the die the die roller one extra time, and so we just threw out all of the all of those numbers. Yeah. And so I had to re-click again, and did I got ze- I went from having being up like six hits to uh, it had zero hits, and then I just kind of like then I lost. I just yeah. slowly wilted away. Um, yeah. So that was my whole fleet basically. Right. Uh, really bummed out, um, basically. And uh, at this point, I got I, I, I got pretty angry. Um, but my move, and I think this was a mistake. I think I should have let you guys know. But I just, like, popped out and went onto the stream and just kind of talked to EJ. And it was great for just, like, kind of calming me down. But I think, <laughs> I think the vibe it sent to the other players was like, oh, he's really mad. Um, yeah, because I believe right I before thinking. I did that, I said, like, man, this is not fun. And then I just left. Yeah. <laughs> this thing yeah. yeah you you literally were like on this over there i had muted myself so that you, I, we could hear you and you were just like this game is not fun for anybody and i was just <laughs> like i was like oh man and i was like hunter you want to talk and hunter was like yeah and so then we had a good time and what yeah. did you guys talk about this is what i want to know uh, we just I'm, i missed we that. just talked about just the goofing. game how it was going okay. and like what yeah. If I had, like, I, I remember I was kind of asking him, like, is there anything I can do from here on out? Because basically it was one of those things where you're about midway through the game and you're just going to have to start over. Like, you don't yeah. have much of a slice left. You, you're you basically going to have to just, like, take strategy cards to accomplish objectives and that's all. You know, when yeah, that, like, that's all you've got. And uh, so for the rest of the game, I was basically just doing that. Like, that's basically yeah. all I did. Um, except I did get pretty trolly towards towards the end, and we we will sure. we'll pick that up. We'll cover that. We get there. Uh, what sucked about your horrible disaster is it had the adverse effect of uh, Magi was setting up to signal jam you, and we had been working out a way to prevent you from getting signal signal jams. Um, and since you lost all your stuff, he had a free signal jamming that could be used elsewhere. Oh so yeah, he ended what, up using what was it. the plan for us stopping him signal jamming me? Uh, it was just going to be to stall him out. You just you had. Oh yeah, yeah, we, yeah. we had the ability to stall him out of using it. Anyways, uh, he ended up signal jamming Mechatol Rex instead. The exact round I was planning to do the really great, you know, I I can use hegemonic trade policy to turn Mechatol Rex into a six one, build eight units there. Like, that was the round where I was supposed to really turn things around and be a thorn in Magi's side. And he stopped it with a single action card uh, that he was going to use on you. Beautiful. So that kind of put me in my... That made me have to slow down, too, and and rethink kind of my, my next couple rounds objective layout. Uh, because now I'm I'm still down units. Objectively, Matt, that, that was a really good play on Magi's part. It was. Oh, it absolutely <laughs> was. I, w- I wasn't even... That's a situation where I wasn't, like, mad about that. It was just like, oh... God, I the the circumstances that led to this really suck. Yep. Hunter's Hunter just had an absolute disaster, and it led to me having a disaster. And only Magi and Yin seem to be having. And actually, even can't even say Yin was having. Like Yin as Sardak is the one who just almost had his home system taken and had to completely redivert. So all this did was like, oh, things look really great for Magi. Whoop de do. Right. Uh, so that's what that that became my fear of what this game was going to turn into is like oh cool now Magi is going to absolutely run away with it. There's no Muat in position to put him in check anymore. He's already got the Graviton PDS network set up. I don't have enough units to start striking into it. I don't know what my options are going to be besides the normal Winu thing of dig into your home system and dig into Mechatol Rex and hope the rest right. works out. Right. Um. So that kind of became my new plan. Oh, and I also um, just want to say in general. Exo Trireme is so much better than War Suns. Like, oh, yeah. for by sure. Because I, 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 I had even forgotten that the way that battle ended up playing out was essentially, it was the reason I was like, oh, this is in my favor is because I just had to kill everything. In, yeah. and, and that was doable because I did do it with, with right. the dice that you I You had rolled. done it once, and then it was And not so correct. he was able to then Exo Trireme and destroy both my War Suns. And then that's just it. There's, that's oh, it. it hurts so bad guys yeah it hurts so bad 
to have yeah, to be on this right. map where it's like everything is like kind of antagonistic towards me, but then I was able to get War Sun too, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> like, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> they're already gone. Uh, so yeah, so now we're moving into round six, and honestly, what's funny about round six is everyone is still decently even. This is where Hunter started to drift away, obviously. Yeah, I mean, his, I don't have all a way of to his things are gone. Um, but the rest of us were staying like on, on on things. But but the objective that came out is, of course, control five tech specialties, which is just like impossible. Nope, not gonna happen here. Uh, so things really stalled out. And uh, Hunter, you just spent the whole round rebuilding. And me and uh, Ma- this is where Magi and I had a good round. And both of us were more or less in the lead. Uh, I wouldn't even say anything especially noteworthy. If, this was after the disaster above Sardak's home system. Things just got really quiet. Uh, and and it just was like a, a super like, what are we doing here vibe? Like. I think round six was like one of the fastest round sixes I've ever experienced just because it was like, okay, and then you do the thing and then I go and then it's your turn. And then, all right, let's, let's like, whereas in a 10 point game around six is like, oh, this is when it's going to end. Right. You know? Well, yeah. Cause it's uh, also 14 points. There, there's also more to go, but yeah. So like I got to 10 points at the end of round six, but it that obviously doesn't matter. And it was just a very, very fast. It felt like around three, Yeah. you know? Well, I mean, I had, I had really messed up by, like playing, like doing something so risky midway through the game, that just was not the time to be that risky. And yeah. I was not set up to recover. I mean, essentially, right. the round, like after I lose all that stuff in round six, all I basically did that round was retake a planet that had been taken from me. Also, every every agenda was a nightmare for me it to the was, point where I didn't yeah. even, I started just not really caring. Uh, yeah. that it was that way but uh i like took a planet back that got taken from me in an agenda uh yeah. and then would just play my strategy cards because i was just pl- i would just play them to get like my one victory point for that round right and then that was it my tech game was real bad it was really really not good yeah because you didn't have the money again you had all command counters which means you didn't have enough money to replenish war suns yeah I didn't, and get I, I didn't have enough money to be putting to be throwing down a bunch of resources on war suns and then also keeping up with uh with tech and i even got trade like more than once so yeah. like i i would have some trade goods um but it just like it's just very expensive to build war suns and then have to rebuild them well, I want to I want to point something out too about a fourteen point game where uh, the mid game or the early game, one of those two things is going to be more exaggerated. In this p- case, mm, it mm-hmm. it was I would say probably the mid game. And if you make an early to an early to mid mid game play like that, like that, you yeah, made, yeah. It, it almost punishes you more. Uh, right. Whereas if you had made that, it's too. Er- it feels like mid game, but it's actually still basically early right. game, which means you're sacrificing something quite early in the game. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah, but guys, it would have been so cool if it, it would have been great so if it worked. Cool. <laughs> if in this game where someone had put, pointed a gun at my head, a hunter buddy, a <laughs> hunter buddy, it would have been so cool. It would have been cool. Like, <laughs> oh man, but it would have been so cool. Can, is that? Can we rename this episode to "It would have been cool"? It would have been cool. <laughs> uh, well, let's talk about round uh, seven, where uh, really it's now it's a three-player game. Hunter's out. I mean, Hunter, Hunter's dead in the water. You're sitting at five or six points. Oh yeah. Well, so uh, so this is, I was at eleven. I want to throw this think, out here real quick. So yeah. Um, there was a point where we had representative government had come out. So everybody had one vote in the agenda phase and, uh, yin for life had put publicized weapons schematics in the agenda. So essentially I, I was just like, I have no idea what I want out of that. And I was just kind of like on a, on a level of just like, this is all set up against me anyways. I want Matt to win. Uh, what do, what do you want, Matt? Because yeah. in the choice between my war sons, which I just have rebuilt, by the way, uh, lose sustained damage. sustained damage, and then like everybody can can re- research war sun easily, which honestly I think would have handed Magi the game personally. Yeah, if he yeah. had war sun, if he if he, he could, had a lot of money, yeah, he had so much resources, he could have probably gotten both war sons out there on the edge uh, and just carved Matt up. 
uh, yep. or I lose all my action cards, which I had a yep. full hand of, and they were very good action cards. Yeah. So that's what I was thinking too. You, because you, you basically told me like Matt, what do you want? And in my in my head, it's the last thing I need is my two opponents here to be able to get War Suns, even though obviously it's the thing of like, are they actually going to go out and buy some War Suns? Who knows? But my only other thing is Hunter's got a War Sun that needs to go blow some stuff up. And if that doesn't have sustained damage, nothing's going to happen there versus he's not even a, in a good position to use his action cards. What good are those really going to do? No, I mean, uh, like I had like stuff that would have been great for late game stuff like in, in the silence of space and like I sure. had a flank speed and a if you had a dude. position to use them right if um, you could have gotten yourself back yeah uh i i mean losing sustained damage on those war suns would have made uh essentially arborek unassailable for me with the mm-hmm. pds and graviton right it would have been completely right. impossible just no no um, doubt. yeah Sardak, it probably would have made no difference because those Exo Triremes are just going to destroy my War Suns anyways. I mean, honestly, I should have quit building War Suns. That is the... Yeah. the... That's just what sucks about Muat, and it's, it's what felt like sucked about Winu is you just... You're, what you're in, like encouraged to do is stop using your abilities. Yeah, um, I, I really... That's really the mistake I made, and my tech game wasn't diversified enough for me to just play like kind of generic Twilight yeah. Imperium with just like a Dreadnought fleet, standard Dreadnought fleet. So right. I had a difficult choice to make in the mid-game, which was do I rebuild these War Sons? Uh, and then that way... I mean, they can move three, so as long as I can rebuild right. them, it's fine. We'll get out there. Right. Um, and you, you got the prerequisites for Cruiser 2 very early. You could have rediverted into like a weird cruiser game and i could have I guess. had the command counter economy m- i don't maybe know if cruisers, to supply it i don't think no. the cruisers would have done very well against arborek or no or i don't think Sarnak. there's anything you could have done against arborek i think it was done uh, that and that's just the nature of arborek in the late game in a 14 point game is at a certain point there becomes nothing you can do about arborek you have to just race them yeah so anyways on top of everything the worst agenda that could come out for me comes out uh i we go with me losing uh my action cards uh, I don't know if that was the right choice, but I don't know what the right choice was. And I was just, oh, I was just done. so done, basically, yeah. uh, with the game at this point. Um, and then we go into the what is what is the final round. Uh, my last contribution to this game, I'll just yep. get it get it out of the way, was uh, I wanted to slow down Arborek because he was uh, just had half of of the map. Uh, and also at right. this point, I would just rather see uh, see Matt win. I'm not going to support the throne, give give him the final point kind of victory. I'm not even in the in the position to do that anyway. Yeah, but you you did. He had already well, he'd already. I, I gave it, I gave it to him in the mid game. game. <laughs> I know. Hey, I'm just hey, saying. I gave it to him in the mid game, and I yeah. also gave it to him for something. I just don't remember what it was. I don't remember what it was either. <laughs> I believe it was. Oh, uh, uh, it was a vote. It was a vote. Oh yeah, it was a vote for me to get um, the thing that won me the game. Yeah. Oh, are you serious? It was, for, it was for committee formation. So I, I yep. paid you off to get committee formation. Oh, that's we- but well, then why did I give you my support for the throne? Or that was it Crown sense. of Amphidia? It was the it was Crown. No, 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 no. We are completely forgetting this. No, you played an Imperial Rider. Oh, that's what it was. Uh, I, yeah. I gave yeah, you yeah, yeah. support so I, for the so- or, or it's. Or you gave me support for the throne so that I would pick your Imperial Rider vote. Which that's I don't true. even remember what it was. You that's guys, we, that's... we just played this game and it feels like last week. Like <laughs> that's, that's true. Uh, yeah, so I, I I played an Imperial Rider and was able to get Matt to give me that point. Because basically everybody else had played their uh, their votes. Um, right. So it was a point for a point. At yeah. That so, that, point. so that was a point for a point. And also, uh, I was really pretty scared of Magi winning that game. Um, yeah, and knowing that you had my support meant that if this goes another round, I'm basically going to very All easily in. be able to stop anybody from winning this game because I'm right. I'm over there by Winu, uh, which is where everything is going down. I, yeah. And also, hey, if I miscalculated this and Matt wins, well, whatever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like that was how I felt. Right. So going into round seven, it was I've got Sardak and Arborek breathing down my throat. I'm sitting at 11 points. They're right behind me. There's like scenarios where both of them could have won for sure, like had certain things gone certain ways. But the big deciding factor was that Hunter sent his his uh, third war son through wormholes to blow up the fleet of um, Arborex. That was the one that was most poised to jump on my stuff to jump on Megatol. 
Arb well, Mechatol or my home system. Arborek and Sardak were talking about a situation of weakening my position to then jump on my home system. They were trying to work out something to do there. And then they, they also then talked about... Me Mechatol came up after. But originally it was, how are we going to get to Matt's home system and stop him from getting to 13 points or maybe winning? Um, but then when you blow up their stuff, they kind of had to reconvene and, and come up with new, new ways to go about it. And uh, from that point on, it was kind of just like a bunch of miscommunication and some plays that didn't work out the way people wanted to uh arborek x89 all my ground forces on mechatol and then i just rebuilt three more right after that which i mean three isn't a lot but it, it just was like this weird kind of like ah we're all b smashing heads here and and honestly by the time that stuff was going down i could already spell out my my victory i i had i had seen it um in my own palm um that you know i i, I was politics and basically what happened was uh, when I drew politics, the first card I saw was Shard of the Throne, and I got committee formation, which is the one that allows you to determine the winner of an elect player vote, and there was basically no way they were going to stop me from scoring the 16 resources objective to get to 13, um, because I had 15 trade goods, and my home system was 3 resources, so like I was guaranteed those 16 um, resources, and when I, I also had the only veto, which means no one was going to veto Shard of the Throne, and I was going to committee form a committee formation it onto myself, right. um, and that. So I, I kind of then just was sitting pretty at the end of the game and wait, waiting for them to kind of wear themselves out. Yeah, see, actions. I didn't know you had that final point, and they they actually kept saying that you had another uh, that you had. Everyone thought there was another round. Do what? I mean, everyone. The, I know Magi said he definitely wins next round that was kind of his stance it's like i'm not yeah. gonna win this round but i have a really good position for round eight my feeling was essentially this i wanted to hurt somebody with my war son <laughs> uh i thought you were basically both gonna be at 13 and yeah, which we i were. picked magi to start with essentially yeah. um i will say this i in a in a kind of trolley way tried to frame a lot of things as if i was just doing whatever was best for you but, like, I actually didn't really have that many options most of the time. And right. generally, I would just be like, hey, Matt, do you want me to do this? And then I would just say what I wanted to do anyways. Right. Like, that was essentially... Yeah. yeah, the first half of the game was you doing surprisingly well and keeping up with the score. And then once the big, bad, terrible thing happened, it was, what else were you gonna really do? And maybe that sounds like a cop-out coming from the two of us. But I don't know, EJ, I think this is where it's really important for you to come in here and, and kind of give the, the outside perspective. Were Hunter and I uh, rigging the game against Yin and Magi? No. <laughs> <laughs> there you uh, have it. There you have it. Uh, and it's settled. No, no, there was no rigging involved. How do you rig TI, really? I mean, I mean... Uh, there are things you can certainly do to help people along, but in the end, right. you have to you have to go out and win a game of TI. You have to go out right. and win it. It's going to be right. won or lost well, by the players and, at the table. And I'll you know, say this, I kind of like that as as a way to kind of settle this this episode in general because a lot of this game was about like how much uh, how much can you make a game take <laughs> a certain shape, right? Because right. this was the attempt of this. That I was feel the like, goal. Was, hey, let's create yeah. a game that's like really not fun for. <laughs> hunt or Anybody. really difficult or well i mean but specifically it was kind of based on the things that i don't like about twilight imperium and yeah like we nailed that like like we, we got we got all <laughs> that in there. It. hey fun fact these are the things hunter does not like about <laughs> twilight oh, and, imperium. And, 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 and i should say as kind of the the conclusion of this Still don't like those things. Still don't like Weird. who I, Still <laughs> don't like four player, uh, fourteen pointer. That's fine. I don't care about that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Billy made a cool map. Uh, I just wanted some more resources in my slice, but but whatever. That's like maps don't all need to be the same. And if I had been playing a different faction, I probably would have been like, this is great. If I had been barony, yeah. oh my god. If I had been right. barony in that Forget slice with two red skips and a bunch of influence, that would have been so cool. <laughs> well that's i think that's about all we've got on this on this game um it it's like despite all the things we've said i think at the end of the day like almost every game of twilight imperium 
in retrospect, it was pretty fun. Yeah, Even it was actually crazy. It wasn't. It, we had a lot of like kind of misery in there. I don't know the upsets of Ti, the things that make you mad. That's part of the catharsis of the experience. Is like I got invested. I, I like I cared about the status of this game, and when things really went south for me, I got nihilistic and I got mad and like came out the other side. And I don't know that that's just part of what this game always does, especially to me as a person who like is you know constantly on the edge of freaking out. I I don't know. That's what I get out of TI is like it's an outlet for for that, you know, for that, for freaking out. Yeah. And then the game ends and you're like, man, I really freaked out back there. Huh? Uh, that was kind of fun. That's wild. Uh, you want to get a beer? Because that was wild. Yeah. Yeah. It's <laughs> yeah. Weird. Weird. How yeah. That so happened. I I will say this. That was probably one of the one of the most stressful games of TI I've ever played. Yeah. Uh, but there is a reward in that, uh, and right. I do want to say for anybody that that watched the stream, <laughs> thank you so much for watching the stream. Uh, thank you, Yin for Life, for for making this Setting happen. That up. And yeah. I, uh, I, what I, I don't want the takeaway to be that this was really stressful and that that no. nothing came of it. This was this was a an interesting day way to spend yeah. a day. Basically, honestly, honestly, and this is how these things always end up going. Um, this reminds me of the fabled, or we haven't talked about it in a long time, but that we have a game in our TI3 history called the Butt Brothers Coalition. Yeah. <laughs> and that was an equally horrible experience that is one of the most memorable games of TI I've ever played. That This is now like one of the most memorable games of TI4 I've ever played. I agree I with will that. remember I this game forever. I'll always remember this game, even though it was crazy and like it, negative at some points. That's part of it. That's like the point of playing TI is to experience those emotions. To me, I, I don't know. And um, but yeah, I, I just, that's, I just that's my takeaway. Uh, that everybody is cool. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I hope. Yeah, there was a moment there where it did not seem like everybody was cool, yeah. and that's the reality of this situation we're trying to like dance around. Yeah. I think things were not exactly great. Hey, there was just you know what it was? Here's here's what it was that that really got me salty and and it and it sucks. I I, I hate any time. I I do not like being angry actually at all. Sure. Um I grew up kind of around a lot of angry people and I would be like, "Ugh, that, I don't like when I'm angry, I'm not good. I'm 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 sassy, I'm rude." Um <laughs> there was something about playing this game that felt so stressful specifically to me like it was like an engine designed to uh -huh. make this hard for me and then just that gun like there's a <laughs> gun like I, I don't right? think i have we i think i've been saying it like it's metaphorical what i mean is there is no, a I'm digital gonna, I'm screenshotting it right now a I'm, digital I'm gun literally pointed at me that just made me feel so like ah like i just wanted to like grab it leave me alone <laughs> yeah but uh but I I think uh, that there was uh, a a different thesis in mind for this episode that Maybe. I think would have been um, very uh, would have had a lot of uh, what is the word I'm looking for? Um, Wish I knew subtlety to it. Like yeah yeah that, yeah I that, see what you're saying. Yeah that that <laughs> had a lot more in it that I feel like kind of got rounded down into kind of uh, antagonism and like just kind of saltiness um that and that for that i do uh i do feel like i'm gonna take a lot of the blame on myself there and apologize for that um is sure. wait is this episode now called smith and wes yin for life <laughs> <laughs> wait what smith, smith and wes it's a gun. <laughs> smith and wes yin for life <laughs> that's good i i like that uh yeah uh what a what a crazy game what a crazy day um yep. I actually, there actually was a point after we got done with the game that we were kind of like, how is this episode going to work? Um, yeah, but this was actually a lot more fun to talk about than, than I think I realized initially. Yeah. Well, let's change the vibe up a little bit, and we've got some errata to discuss. EJ, you're gonna, do you want to stick around and help us figure out what the future of the show uh, is going to look like? Do you want me to we, stick why around? Don't, why, don't, why don't we bring EJ in to just offer up his opinion on, on the things what we've been shaking up? Yeah, well, man, Space I'm not driving. Tools. So one thing I <laughs> one thing I want to say before, um, just in case there are people that like tune out after we get done with the regular episode, uh, please get a ticket to our live episode uh, for Gen Con. It's going to be happening on Thursday at three p.m. Uh, there's we still have plenty of tickets available. 
Um, and what we're going to do is play the notoriously bad Twi Twilight Imperium RPG in front of a live audience. There will be guests. It will be very fun. Uh, it will be uh, funny, cool. Check it out. I'm so Weird, excited wacky. about it. It's going to be very yep. cool. Yeah, and and it's going to be wait. fun. Did I mention it's going to be fun? It's and it's also, fun. don't forget about that it's going to be cool, too. Okay, so welcome to Space Cats, Beast Turtles, Errata. Oh, we haven't done a lead into Errata in a minute. That I know. Feels good. I, we've been kind of skipping it for a while. That feels good. Uh, we should bring that back. Um, so the <laughs> the first thing we need to talk about is the new the new game, the game that we are going to yeah. add. If you don't know, if you didn't, if you missed last week, we are not. This podcast is about to make a huge decision, which is yeah. that we are about to become a podcast about not one board game. But two board games. Oh if my the, gosh! If, if that was the, if, <laughs> if a podcast such a about thing one, exists. if a podcast Sweet about one, God. if a podcast about one board game wasn't weird enough, now you're going to be able to say, "Hey, there's a podcast, and it's only about two <laughs> board games." It's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Like yeah. the, the duality <laughs> of men. Hey, Hunter, what's your podcast about? Oh, two things. It's about two board games. <laughs> two That's things. even worse than one board game. Yeah. Like, <laughs> at least you have uh, a focus. At least you're focused with one board so, game. With two, it's like, what are you even doing anymore? Right. Yeah. Right. And so there, there was so much feedback that we got so that it's almost impossible to just like list everybody. That I mean, we got so many suggestions, and we kind of want to talk through where we're at now and what what the voting process going forward kind of looks for, like. yeah. for your second board game. For the yes. second board game. Okay. Um, so first things first, thank you to everyone who sent suggestions. There's a lot of games I hadn't heard of that that are like great additions. There's things I learned about games I didn't know that were like now considering and hadn't been before. And there's also some stuff that we're willing to take off the table because um, because of just what what the discussions that have been happening right. around these because of games. lack of popularity and mostly yeah. people reaching out to be like no that game's bad we no, don't want that it's game. not yeah don't. and that and the main one to point out then is we had five we had four games on the list and we were looking to add a fifth we are taking star trek ascendancy out sorry for all the huge star trek ascendancy fans out there it does sound like a fun game and by no means are we saying it's not a fun game worthy of us playing but everything we've heard is it is a game more about exploration and kind of the randomness that happens within that and less of a like game where you make really bold strategic decisions that have like a meta depth to them. Mm -hmm. And it's more about you're just you're always playing against the odds right. a little bit right. rather than maybe as much against the place. That's our interpretation. Maybe that's wrong, but we are taking Star Trek Ascendancy off of our list of four. Um and so that makes the three remaining still Game of Thrones, Mother of Dragons, which is the expansion. So we're not playing just base game Game of Thrones, but there's a new expansion out that makes it a lot more in line with the type of game we're wanting to play. Mm -hmm. Also on there is the classic Diplomacy. And uh, we're leaving Root on the list, which is kind of like just a different, totally uh, a way to really shake things up. And to replace Star Trek Ascendancy, we are forcing the board game Dune onto the list. Yeah. Now... I'm going to already start pleading the case that like now honestly Dune is Dune is up there. Dune's like my number one. Uh, I'm just going to be upfront about that. I, I most want to transition into Dune. We trust the patrons to still I mean we, we love any of these games that we might get but the things that I've learned about Dune is that a the new edition the, the reason we weren't we didn't put Dune on the list is because we thought there's a new edition coming out but that might be a while. We have no indication but we have since learned that there will be copies at gen con uh which means that the release may or may not be imminent but regardless there's a decent chance we could get a hold of a copy at gen con and that just seems like perfect timing to take advantage of right. and second every time i've played the game rex which is based off of dune it's set in the twilight imperium universe uh, i will say that much we're not going to do if we do dune we're not doing rex we'll, we'll probably talk a little bit about rex occasionally because it's part of the ecosystem of that game in the same way that we talk about twilight imperium third edition every once in a while um but uh the, every time I've played Rex, I play it so rarely that I get a glimpse into what kind of strategic depth the game has, and I never get to explore it, but it seems exactly like the kind of game I want to play. So Dune is is really high up there just because the timing of it would be really great, and it's it's just it really fits with what we're already 
kind of doing. So those are definitely our four games, but we are still looking for a fifth game. We want there to be five games to be voted on. Right. Right. Um, I, I want to play devil's advocate real quick and throw one thing out as a point against Dune. Like, I don't I don't want anyone listening to Absolutely. think, like, well, you guys should just do Dune then, obviously, because it sounds like that's right. the one you want to do. No. Here's, the, here's the reason I would maybe not do Dune, um, yep. and it's that of all of these games, um, we know they're all winners. Dune is technically, even though it's based right. on a game that we've already played, it might, I mean, there might be some junk in there. It might be right. that we open it up and we're like, oh, this game is bad. Um, yeah. I mean, there's no indication of, like, how much they're changing in the new edition Mm -hmm. it's just really hard to say it's a decent it's a good publisher uh it's it's gale force nine and they're not bad they do star trek ascendancy honestly and they they do a lot of other good games but yeah you're right if they make changes that are like oh this is a dumpster fire of a board game well okay maybe we should reevaluate so there is a big question mark on dune right Right. but i'm i i I was specifically just playing devil's advocate there and not necessarily saying that that's what i hunter think i I am also excited badly (laughs) about any of these games but uh, i'm kind of leaning towards dune as well which is cool so we should talk about the games that people have brought up like well hold on a second hold on a second because dune because i want to say as somebody who knows nothing about dune or Uh or board games um (laughs) I'm, I'm gonna, to I'm gonna say that Dune is a board game coming out, and yeah. that's exciting for me, and right. maybe you should be excited for it as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, honestly, that's kind of the thing. Is also Dune is the least pressure on us to get. Like diplomacy yeah, really is, is so much pressure to nail it. It's just so much absolute pressure. It freaks me out. Dune hasn't come out yet. Yeah, who knows how it's? You know, we'll, we're we're learning the game with everybody else. Although that's probably not true because it's probably very similar to the game that's been around for a very right, long time. Right. But we get to say, hey, come on, it's a new game. What, what are you gonna do? Wait, Matt. But what if it isn't? What if it isn't? I don't know. <laughs> Let's true. talk about the other suggestions that have been thrown out there. We kind of want to go through some some of the uh, themes of ideas um, and and kind of talk talk through those a little bit and talk about what's good and what is bad about. Uh, all these different suggestions, just so people keep pushing for uh, for new things. But we're we're getting close to the end of like offer us any suggestion. Basically, next week we're going to a, to decide on what the final uh, five games are, and then we'll start doing basically a bracket of voting uh, through the next two months to get rid of some games. Um, so let's let's talk through uh, some stuff, Hunter. I want you to lead off with this first one because you have the most experience. Okay, with so it. Um, I was actually very surprised that so many people brought this game up. Because we had talked about, oh, should this game be on the list? And I was like, oh, you know, I don't think people are super hot on that game anymore. Um, But Twilight Struggle, the um, essentially Cold War, it's a Cold War board game where one of you plays as the United States and the other plays as the USSR. And uh, it's got cards and you move little tokens around and it's really fun. And it's um, just a two-player game. Two-player game, yeah. Like, so me and Matt it. would uh, would I would play USSR, and Matt would play would play the US. Um, <laughs> I've already decided that's how it'll go because I love the USSR. <laughs> uh, I have played this game uh, seven or eight times, uh, so I'm not I'm not a pro, but I have played it a lot. And I will say this: here's a weird thing about Twilight Struggle that I'm sure somebody on the Discord will will hit me up and be like, uh, "Hey, let's change that." But thus far, <laughs> I have not lost a game of Twilight Struggle. Ooh. Wow. Yeah. So, Hunter, what are the pros and cons of Twilight Struggle being uh, the fifth game? What, what, are, what are the pros and cons of us approaching Twilight Struggle? Well, I think it's weird timing. To, that, that's why I left it, uh, like, why it was not included yeah. originally uh, is because it just doesn't, it feels like a weird time to do Twilight Struggle. Um, it It's a game that's been out for a while. Uh, it, it isn't so old that it's like a legacy game, like Diplomacy um, we wanted to have by one, legacy one you mean game. like not not the current understanding of legacy games but like actual has a legacy yeah um right like we wanted to have one like old school game on there and and yeah. for some reason twilight struggle didn't come up in our heads of as being oh this is old school um, right because if anything it's kind of like one of the one of the great games that had kind of kicked off this newer wave of board game like right. this board game renaissance that we're like still sort of living in. Yeah. Um, well, and it was number one on board game geek for a, for quite a while. Nowadays, board game geek is a little bit more controlled by like 
the cult of the new, right? Like mm-hmm. Gloomhaven is the number one game. And Gloomhaven, nothing against it. It is a great game, but it's pretty weird for like a pretty brand new game to just like spike to the top of the list. Before right. it was Pandemic Legacy. All of these brand new games keep jumping to the top. Whereas Twilight Struggle had like a pretty long standing lead. Oh, yeah. Which is proof of its like longevity and how good of a game it is and its uh, quality. Still in it, the top it, it, 10, it is very it is very good. It is very good. Um I I think that uh, I would be happy with it in that in that fifth spot if that's what people want. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's also a game where there's a lot of optimal plays. It kind of has mm-hmm. like a chess like quality to it, where yeah. you can basically say, well, there's this opening and then there's this opening, um, and it's not quite as like I mean, some of these games I'm not super familiar with, but it's it's on the less random side in my opinion. There are right. there are cards. Uh, the order that you get the cards uh, and and the effects that the cards have on them are, are random as far as like oh you, you don't know when you're going to draw this card but you do know what you're going to get and the decks yeah. are not very large um, yeah so there's a little bit of random swerving there but it's not too random so I think in general um, games that are like super about like here's the optimal thing that you do uh, we kind of already have diplomacy which sort of has uh, right. an, an aspect to that. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know. I just feel like Twilight Struggle got kind of bumped out, uh, yeah. but you guys could totally pop it in there you if, if you guys oh, yeah. say it loud, you know? Yeah. Uh, the next one that's kind of been a, been a contender, a front runner for this fifth spot is a game called Gaia Project. Uh, Gaia Project is by the same people who did Terra Mystica. Uh, and Terra Mystica was huge when it came out. Very, very, very popular. It's a little bit Euro-y, um, which I would say is the number one weakness for Gaia Project, um, is the idea of us doing a Euro where typically there's not that much interaction. I mean, Hunter and I both are very into meta stuff, and Euros just always lack that. Obviously, there's always room for that. There's there's going to be some things that happen above the table, but generally games like Gaia and also on the list is Scythe, uh, which is a bit Euro-y as well. You just spend so much time in your own stuff that that's kind of all we would ever be talking about for the most part. Um, and and so that that stuff, that's why that is a little bit weaker to me. But at the same time, obviously, there's a huge amount of strategic depth to talk about. Uh, with Scythe, I know there's a number of factions that we could dig into. I believe Gaia Project has some of that going on. Regardless, uh, both of those games... Uh, people have been pushing those forward, but then we've seen a lot of backlash against those kinds of games. There's a lot of people who don't really want to see a Euro uh, pushed up to the front. Yeah. And I, I I get that. I think that's going to end up being sort of the, the the weakening factor for games like Gaia Project and Scythe. Yeah. Uh, I also want to throw out, so is has have people brought up Terra Mystica a lot? Because that's... Uh, those people games... did bring up... Yeah, people brought up Terra Mystica. Uh, I think generally... Anytime it was brought up, it was like, well, if you're going to do Terra Mystica, you might as well do Gaia Project because it's a newer mm-hmm. uh, and more popular and in in theory better. I'm sure there's people that would disagree with that, but you would think that, you know, they're improving on the mechanics in Terra Mystica and implementing those improvements into Gaia and Project. Also so. in space. And it's also in space. <laughs> in space. <laughs> Versus not in space. Yeah, and we want to keep with the space thing, right? But Speaking like of it's in keeping... the title. Like you, okay, so like, I don't know if you guys know this about your podcast <laughs> name. Oh, right. But the first word of it <laughs> is space. Uh oh. Yeah, so you, like maybe stay there. I have yeah. a way. I have a. I have a solution, and this is one that hasn't talked about been talked about very much, but it's because we did bring it up and we almost wrote it off last week. But uh, Hunter, you've got a you got a sales pitch for ye old cosmic encounter there that yeah. I think you need to um, toss out. I think I think Cosmic uh, was I mean Cosmic way back when we started this show I, there was a point where I thought like oh I wonder if we'll talk about more games eventually and I was like oh probably Cosmic um, yeah. and uh, I, actually I'll I'll throw out the cons first um, it's a weird time to be talking about Cosmic um, yeah. it would be cool if they came out with a new edition I kind of thought the other day but I don't know if they will like yeah I don't know it, it, there's almost I think just as much temptation to just keep throwing new factions right. at Wasn't Cosmic. there just a, like, the last expansion was not that long ago. That's true. Uh, they, they tend to keep it pretty fresh, and there's a lot of expansions, and I would say that's another con, um, is how many expansions right. there are. <laughs> right. um, but the way I envisioned a Cosmic Encounter um, podcast working, not that it would be separate from this one, but if we, if we included no. it, um, me and Matt would just play that game, mm-hmm. and then just immediately after we got done just do an episode talking about the faction that we played as because there's so many 
in Cosmic Encounter that, uh-huh. and they're not overly complicated, I feel like, uh, to where you couldn't just basically play it one time and then like kind of whip up a pretty decent beginner's guide to that faction. Right. Um, they are all like the amazing thing about Cosmic Encounter is the variety. Um, right. And I think it would be fun to just kind of like slowly just kind of go through all of those. Right. Um, Explore all of that. Yeah. Uh, and I would say that Cosmic Encounter has not come up uh, that many times as far as people throwing it out there. But it, I feel kind of like that I want to make this case uh, that maybe this should be the fifth game. I'm not even saying that. Uh, if it made the fifth game that I'd be like, oh, that's got to be it. Um, right. I just felt like it was a game uh, worth making a case for because uh, I could just kind of see how it would work. It would just be like, it would be just like Twilight Imperium, just like we are only ever talking about playing as a different alien race. Um, yeah. And we can be very like straight to the point and just like, oh, I played so-and-so the other day. Here are my thoughts on it. Um, this is not yeah. an end-all be-all guide, but like Cosmic is about variety. It's not about like, yeah. it's not so deep that you can't get it after just playing it once. You right. Know? You- yeah. The interesting thing about that is it would be a very different vibe of a, of a show. Like For the sure. Cosmic episodes would feel fairly different than a TI episode. I agree. Right? Maybe that's agree. a good thing. Maybe that's a bad thing. Hard to say. What oh, were you going to say, EJ? Oh, that, no, I was going to, first off, follow up. Uh, it's definitely a good thing. Uh, <laughs> just kidding. Gotcha. Um, no, uh, <laughs> I think the Cosmic Encounter, if you're going to play Devil's Advocate to that game, uh, Variety is great, but that game can uh, certainly, I, I guess I kind of talked about it earlier, but I, you know, it can certainly break a little bit and, yeah. and yeah. to the point to where it's almost not as good. Uh, but I think yeah. it's a great game, honestly. Like me being done with that, I would say it's uh, it's my one of my favorites on the list. Probably my second favorite for your guys' next uh, project. So yeah, it yeah. it can certainly break itself, which is odd. It's just it's crazy that that can happen. Well, and if anything, too, that's kind of a fun space to explore. Them <laughs> to me is like so the game broke. Let's talk about <laughs> yeah, how that happens. True. So when you're playing as this faction, what's how do you break it? How yeah. do you just break the thing? Yeah. Um. All right. Well, let's talk about uh, kind of just like one more here. This one is this one's new to me i don't know much about it but i have seen a lot of buzz about it and a lot of people i uh respect on twitter a lot of board game personalities are a huge fan of heroes of land air and sea it's a 4x game with uh kind of a it's a 4x game that seems i don't know if this is true but it seems a little bit more kid friendly and to 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 that i mean like there's just some good exploration the theme isn't going to just turn kids off because it's too like serious and spacey it's like it's got a fun art style is the main thing but it also seems like it has a lot of depth it's a huge game there's all there's just like so much to it i guess the minis are very good it's one that is another wild card but it's been mentioned enough times that i think it's worth bringing up and it's something we could learn more about to see uh if it belongs there so I, i'd be interested basically to hear from more people uh, if they believe that Heroes of Land, Air, and Sea deserves to be uh, contested for that fifth spot, because I, I just don't know if a, about it. Yeah, you know what it looks like to me? It just looks like somebody took Warcraft and was like, let's let's do Warcraft the board the game, 4X. but like yeah, it's good, yeah. basically. Right, right. Yeah, maybe, yeah and, it's and, made by the same people who made all the Tiny Epic games as well, and those games oh, are... Oh, yeah! I and love those, those, those people! Those are very... And those are all very good. Like, I have not played one yep. I dislike. Yep. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm very interested in hearing more about that and more about any other 4X games. Now the things that we need to put to rest a little bit, we've, we've gotten so many suggestions and a lot of them, I think we have to just kind of nip in the bud a little bit, which is to say, uh, first off, I do not think co-op games are gonna, are gonna work much at all. Lots of people suggested Gloomhaven cause it's very popular, but, uh, first off legacy games would be hard to do in general, like as a strategy cast where we're spoiling things. It's just a hard market that's a hard thing to sell um but even more so co-op games we're interested in strategy against each other not most co-op games devolve into solve the puzzle and i don't think hunter and i want at least as our next game to be something where it's like all right let's spend a couple months solving the puzzle and then and then move on from that yeah that might be something we do down the road but i i I, I'm going to already say nothing like that is going to make it onto this list right? Uh, this time around. I think there's a chance that this is the beginning of a, a kind of widening out of the show um, in, into more stuff like that. But this is all about baby steps, and this is all about yep. taking our time and doing it right and, and keeping right. with what makes this show 
this show. Like we don't want to we don't want to give up this show's identity. And so if the genre of board game is co-op or legacy, even if we love those games, I, it's it's not the right time yet. We're not there. Yeah. We don't have a place for that in our ecosystem. Basically. Right. Yeah. The, uh, the other the other type of game to kind of uh, to toss out are things that are really, really hard to get a hold of or like nobody talks about anymore or just like I, I got I, I, I love Billy. He gave us this map. He's been talking a lot about Cthulhu Wars. Cthulhu Wars does look super awesome. Also, not an easy game to get a hold of and not just uh, you got to remember we're not just talking about a game that we need to try to get a hold of we want to play this game with you the point of this is to pick a game that has a widespread appeal so that we can all be we want errata if we're doing cthulhu wars we'll be one of like four people that listen to this show that will be like responding to us and there's just that's not ripe for a discourse we want a game that encourages a back and forth of discussion uh, so games that are like long time, you know, there's been a few suggestions for like really old war games. And as much as I do want to play those, they're not going to be right for the show. A lot of the uh, 18XX games, right? Those economic like train games. Those are so hard to like pick the one that is like the best one or whatever. All that stuff where it's just like really rare games and things that are hard to get a hold of. It's just not the route we're going to go down. I mean, you, you got to kind of accept that we're going to stick in that major publisher current game realm um, that's why we stick with like fantasy flight stuff right. and games that are about to be released i mean diplomacy and twilight struggle are probably the two least like that on our list and diplomacy has been around forever and hasn't hasn't gone anywhere and twilight struggle is just so strong and is still you know in print and it's easy to get that it, it allows itself to stay relevant uh we want the genre to stay within competitive strategy um, we, we, we're not ready to do, to branch out into co-op, uh, legacy games as well. Uh, we don't, we just don't know how to do those two in the context yeah. of the show yet. Um, and then also if your game is hard to get a hold of, honestly, even if it's too expensive, if it's, yeah. out of, if it's out of print, um, TI it, is really the limit to what like we can talk about as in terms of price because people, people are already priced out of playing TI, but. Oh you know, yeah, Twilight Imperium is already that. expensive, but, but at least Twilight Imperium is just one box that you got to buy. And I'll right. say this, that is a good point against Cosmic Encounter cuz Cosmic Encounter right. is not a very expensive game. However, if we decide that we're going to play with every expansion, yeah. it might be that we're saying, "All right, well, plop down 250, 300 bones to get on the same page we're at," which I'm not in love with that idea. So, yeah. Well, I think that's that's a good place to stop. I think the the one note I do want to say on on the, on the back end too is there has been a couple mentions of um, I don't even want to say concern, but there's just people that that are are wondering like what kind of shape this thing is gonna take. Um, and I want to just reinforce again, in no way are we abandoning Twilight Imperium. I would even say the majority of episodes will probably still be about Twilight Imperium. We're just looking for other things to talk about as well uh, we want to explore something new we enjoyed the process of the early days of learning about ti4 and we just really want to go through that again that feels even to, to me that's even more the character of space cats peace turtles than it being a podcast about twilight imperium it's that like when we started it all we had were the components we'd never even played the game and we learned as we went and we we came with some experience but we were also just kind of like trying out the space and, and and learning as we went. And I really am very interested in doing that again. Yeah. Um, I, I like being a podcast that discusses and learns from its listeners and uh, changes its opinion over time and uh, can still also offer something to new players and experienced players alike. So right. right. I, that's, I, that's my goals. Yeah. I, I feel like that, that is really the goal here. Um, and, and I will say this as a little, as a little caveat to all of this, um, we are trying to kind of reset and really attack Twilight Imperium again yeah. in a very hardcore strategy guide way like we used to. Um, yeah. It's just that I think, honestly, going back over the strategy guides and, and retooling them, uh, we would like to kind of chew on even more than that. That 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 yes. project is is worthy, but like we can do more. I think yeah. that's really all we're trying to do is is give you guys more stuff, um, more yeah. things to consume, and and 
and more things to talk about just to keep the discussion going. Um, yeah. Another thing that's worth putting out there, if there is, uh, you know, we all know that at some point there probably will be an expansion to Twilight Imperium. And I guarantee yeah. you, once that is the case, this show will go hardcore back on just being about Twilight Imperium right. for a while. Yeah, even like, if we're in the middle of describing some other game, we're going to completely abandon that game. That's almost a promise just because of how excited I'm going to be for an expansion. I'm not going to be able to divert any attention to any other thing we're working on. Actually, I imagine so, how that would work is it would get announced and then me and you would have to rush to finish the game we're working on yeah, currently. Right. And it'd be super Before stressful. we can get a hold of. And yeah. then we, you know, then we start playing. The, the TI expansion, if if one exists, and as of now, we we just have no idea what the timeline is on that. You know, yeah, I mean, yeah. it could be so. it could be a year, it could be two years, it could be three years. You know, we don't right. know what to expect. We gotta we gotta do our own thing in the meantime, and and if that changes, boy howdy, will we redivert again? Right. Uh, so just this show is always evolving. So we hope we we hope you stick with us, and we hope you stick with us. By following us on Twitter at Space Cats Pod, uh, please rate us on your podcast app of choice, iTunes especially. Uh, the the ratings there play a big role in the visibility of this show. Uh, please follow us on Facebook, uh, Facebook Space Cats Peace Turtles. You can find our posts on the Twilight Imperium subreddit. You can join our Patreon and do an episode like this where you could just play a game with us and make us talk about it. Uh, that was. Brought to you by Yin for Life, one of our space kitties. Uh, you can join our Discord to get in on the conversation and be especially a part of this conversation that is ongoing about what will the next game be. My name is Hunter Donaldson, and I'm a comedian. Uh, I'm here, uh, and I host a show, co-host a show, every single Thursday in Portland, Oregon, called Earthquake Hurricane. You can see that at Ford Food and Drink. The show starts at 8 p.m. Uh, it has been off the chain lately that show it's been really fun um and it is not always like that so i would say if you <laughs> if you've been on the fence uh come out because they've been really really fun lately and also i'm going to be co-hosting a new comedy show uh that's going to be weekly um the show is going to be called comedy is everything and that will be at alberta street pub every single sunday at 9 p.m um that uh that show will start this week. So starting this Sunday and all the Sundays after that forever, I'll be there, baby. Uh, I want to thank our Patreon space kitties. I want to thank Billy, TG Welch, Patience is a Virtue, Naderate, Jim Bob, and especially Yin for Life for giving us today's episode. And I also want to thank EJ for hanging out with yeah, us Yeah, thank today. you, EJ. Hey, no problem, guys. Thanks for having me. Uh, just, you know, I love you guys is all. <laughs> <laughs> Like, I just want to be clear that, like, I, I, lo I love you. Yeah. Well, I love you too, buddy. Mm -hmm. And we're out. All right, bye. <laughs> bye. I mean, you don't have to go right away. Thank you for listening to Space Cat's Peace Turtles, and thanks to Ben Prunty for the use of his music. You can find more at benpruntymusic.com and benprunty.bandcamp.com. Pax Magnifica, Bellum Gloriosum.